Okay, welcome back. Welcome. So we've been talking talking about uh, the church of God as as an army of God, um, but the importance of taking a stand, standing firm, being steadfast, uh, having that attitude of a warrior, uh, and this is for individuals and also as a collective, right? Um, how many of you know that uh, winning a soul is a battle? Right? So when you pray for a lost soul or for a city that is lost, you know, full, uh, that you want it to be saved and all of that. Um, you know, I, I know of people who make uh, prayers like uh, other men of God, uh, they make prayer for a certain city to be a cancer free zone or, you know, they don't want a single case of cancer to be in, in a city. Uh, and so those are prayers of a warrior. Why do we call prayer warriors? <laughs> right? Because they have this attitude, this zeal of a warrior, right? Um, is this, I like war movies, you know. Uh, I don't like what war does, uh, where it kills a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of children lose their fathers, mothers, parents, etc. I don't like what it does. But uh, again, it, historically, from a history point of view, when you see what people have gone through, so uh, where I can be what, doing what I'm doing today, right? For example, why we celebrate our freedom fighters and all of that, uh, they've paid the price so that you and I can live a certain life today, isn't it? And so a warrior pays a price, a soldier pays a price. Most of the time, it will not go, it might go unnoticed or unappreciated. But you pay the price, uh, right? So um, I remember watching a short film, actually, a twenty-minute film uh, on a sniper. You know, a sniper. Who a sniper is? A scouts, Scots, a scout sniper is. Uh, they can take shots from very far, far distance, from at least you know kilometers away. Like uh, the longest shot taken, I think, is a record of almost two kilometers. Uh, almost, right? It's yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So uh, a scout sniper's responsibility would be so there's this during the Vietnam War um, between US and Vietnam uh, in the s late 60s and the 70s, was, uh, one of the snipers had to travel just by crawling inch by inch for five days in the ground without food. You're crawling slowly for five days just to carry out your mission. Think about the perseverance, the focus, um, and just the mental strength of a soldier, of a person like that. Are you with me? Right. It's uh, and so the thing of uh, using the example of a sniper because uh, the sniper cannot be seen. The sniper will not, uh, a person with a scout and sniper, uh, he will not take a shot until he's 100% sure. Because as soon as he makes that shot, everybody will know where the sniper is because of that flare, you know, that goes off. And so he's given away his position. You know what I'm saying? So everybody, the enemy will know, okay, that's where the shot came from. Uh, and he will not take the shot until unless he has to make that shot. And so, you know, and, and I mean, this story was so inspiring that um, he was so focused, full of perseverance and resilience that he would just move. And no matter how hard it was, you know, he would push, he would push, didn't want to give back, you know, didn't want to give up. Uh, no food, no problem. Rain, no problem. Insects all around, no problem. Mosquitoes, no problem. I'm going to move slowly and slowly and slowly until I finish uh, you know, my, my objective or my mission. Uh, and similarly, the local church is called to... Now, anybody who signs up for a military or a navy or whatever, they just don't give you, okay, all right, all right come on, let's go. They do that. They take you in, and what they do is they train you. They have a boot camp where they, all the soldiers go and they get trained 
for weeks. And so the church is to be a place where so you know where we come together as a collective. It's a it's like a boot camp where you come and get equipped and trained and empowered, and so that you can go and wage your war, and we can wear wars, wage wars together. Right, so we intercede for the city. Uh, you know, intercession simply means what? Standing in the gap. That's what it literally means. Uh, Abraham stood in the gap. If there's one person, will you spare the city? Moses is like, you know, they are not my people; they are your people. So, <laughs> um, right. So uh, we are to be believers who are to be trained in spiritual warfare, to be taught. Um, and all of that. So uh, let's move on. Um, we are to be armed and dangerous. God has given us spiritual weapons that are mighty. Uh, this is a very important verse. Okay, when it comes to spiritual warfare, uh, I, I feel like this is one of the topic. It's a very well-known topic called spiritual warfare, but not a lot of them actually spend time studying on it because it feels too intimidating. Usually, or it's, we leave that out to all the Pentecostals. Uh, the, only the intercessors, the prayer warriors, let them, you know, talk about spiritual warfare. And, you know, I'm just going to study on the Lord is my shepherd. You know, it's nice. <laughs> but 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5, very important. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Okay. So, for we, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. The word according is very important there. We do not war according to the flesh. Okay, it's like saying, let's play that game, but let's play that, uh, let's not play that game in his terms. Let's play the game in our own terms. Are you saying, are you with me? Right? Um, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means it's not flesh, it's not tangible. But mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Ha. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Pastor Jake spoke on thought yesterday. I you know, had some a lot of questions on it yesterday, right? On thoughts, um, very interesting questions, right? Okay, how can you know? How do I know if the thought if the thought is my own or if it's from God, etc., uh, etc., et right? Uh, so once we have the revelation or that awareness, we bring it into captivity. If you know that you're not supposed to be having the thought, don't entertain it. Compromise. Don't entertain it, right? Um, David's sin was not looking at Bathsheba the first time. He kept looking. Looking at it the second time. The downfall starts there. Maybe sometimes you can't help what you're seeing. You're like, oh, oh gosh. He saw that. All right. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. <laughs> right? So, taking every thought captive. Um, we don't wage war according to the flesh. Um, so what are some of the weapons? It says that uh, weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That, that means we have weapons, but they're not tangible ones. So what are they? Okay, some of the weapons that we've been given as believers, uh, in which we must be trained in, is the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. My gosh, that alone is enough. It's enough. But we have quite a few, but let's see, you know. But, <laughs> but God is good, isn't it? He's generous. He likes to give, right? It's like, come on, just take it, enjoy. Right? Go for whichever weapon you want. Destroy the enemy, you know. Uh, so we, that's why we are called more than conquerors. Uh, the weapons that we have are we don't know how powerful they are. The enemy knows how powerful they are. <laughs> right? Um, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Do you know the story, right? Um, Ananias and Paul. Now, Paul has had his encounter on the road to Damascus. He's blind. Um, and God tells an, a person called Ananias, go meet Paul, anoint him. 
Ananias says, Lord, what's wrong with you? You know, this man pulled out people and killed them. He persecutes the church. How can I go? God's response is beautiful. He is my chosen instrument. I have chosen him to carry my name, to declare and proclaim the good news to the lost. Right? Every, uh, it's Acts chapter 9, verse 15, by the way. We can think of a lot of brands, isn't it? Uh, all the brands, Nike, Reebok, Adidas, Zara, Forever 21, whatever, Nike. <laughs> the list can go on, right? Uh, you know, iPhone, iPad, iWatch, Samsung, uh, Ford, HP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Ferrari, Lamborghini. What is all that associated with? Every single brand and more that we've mentioned wants to want wants you to carry their name. Uh, huh? You carry okay. Nike separate respect. Adidas another respect. You know iPhone, Apple. Oh Apple Pro. Oh my gosh. You know, how do you get it? It's like no, I sold one kidney. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's no cost EMI. You know, swipe my card. <laughs> right, all of those brands, they want you to carry their name. In in professional sports thing, we call it as endorsement. Right? If Roger Federer is wearing Nike, I want to wear Nike. Because they know if a certain person carries their name, a lot of other people are going to want to carry that same name. You know where I'm going with this, no? You and I are God's chosen instrument called to carry his name, to put his name on display. Not just on our t-shirts or our coffee mugs. I love Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. My light and my salvation is like, wow, looks so nice. Mm, coffee with Jesus. <laughs> coffee with Jesus. Uh, so next time if I see a cup like that, I'll know. <laughs> you and I are called to carry the name of Jesus, the wonderful name of Jesus. The beautiful name of Jesus, right? The name that is high above every other name. Um, if you can just stay in that moment and just ponder on the name of Jesus, uh, there's another APC publication, Mighty Name of Jesus. Um, if, you, if you can get your hands on it, please study it. Uh, we need we need every revelation possible of the name of Jesus, what it means, what it can do. Of all the names in the world, why would God give him his son the name Jesus? He could have named him Roshan. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, Anand, whatever. Okay. <laughs> why Yeshua? Yeshua Hamasiya. Mm, right. I mean, I, yeah. Savior, deliverer, that's what it means. Um, yeah, we carry the name of Jesus. That's wow, that's incredible. And the word of God, right? Uh, Hebrews 4:12, it says his word of is like it's a, it's a sword. It's, it's not just another sword, it's a double-edged sword. A double-edged sword that is sharp both ways, up and down. Most of the swords are sharp one side, a single edged. Where a double-edged sword is sharp both. It, and that's where it goes on to say, uh, the word of God is alive and active. How many of you know that Bible is prophetic in nature? Yeah. It's alive. It's active. It's the Holy Spirit that brings it to life. That's why Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open my eyes to the hidden things of your word. That means you can just read it as a book, as a history book. And ask questions like, is the Bible relevant? Because for many who don't have that revelation, who don't go to it in humility, it's just another book, historical book, and a good one. <laughs> but it may not necessarily be active and alive for them. Are you with me? 
right? And so we believe that the word of God is the inspired word of God, isn't it? Uh, inspired, inspiration. Again, Latin word means in spirito, by the spirit, in the spirit, right? And so it's alive. Look at that verse, what it says, 4.12, Hebrews 4.12. Uh, is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It's not just a double-edged sword. It's sharper than any. Hmm. And what it does, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. That means it's, we can do a word, I mean, a verse mapping on this. We are not going to do that, but, you know, uh, joints and marrow. That means it can divide the thing, the matters of the heart, soul, you know, and spirit. It judges the thoughts, thoughts again, and attitudes of the heart, intentions. Yeah. The word of God is powerful. It's a hammer. Like we've just looked at, right? So we have the name of Jesus, the Word of God. Time and time again, Jesus, when he was fighting, not fighting, he was just, I mean, the devil is not Jesus' equal. We need to get that straight. The devil is not Jesus' equal. Right? Of everything that Jesus could have done, he said, It is written. It is written. It is written. He used the word. Right? Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay, let it dwell in you. Dwell again. Okay. It's another word for tabernacle. Let it be tabernacle. And the root, literal, the raw meaning of that is pitch the tent. Let the word of God put one tent and stay inside. That's what it literally is. Right? Um, you want to write songs? Let it rich in you dwelly, and he will give you the melody. I mean, so you know, okay, which verse to write, take the, you know, so because it's like dwelled in you richly. Right? So the word of God. Next, let's move on. The blood of Jesus and the completed work of the cross. A position in Christ, the full armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 onwards. Uh, prayer and intercession, praise and worship, uh, repentance and righteousness. Uh, we don't have enough sermons on repentance. Why don't one of you actually work on a sermon called repentance? Do a research, do your study, and have a sermon on the topic of repentance. Can you do that? Right. Yeah? Okay. Hey, one of the tools mentioned the uh, weapon is praise and worship. Uh, we know Psalm 22, verse 3, it says, God is enthroned on the praises of his people. There's one a version that says, God inhabits the praises of his people. Right? If God inhabits our praise, who inhabits our complaints? Uh, okay. If God is enthroned on our praises, who is enthroned on our complaints and our grumblings and our mumblings? Who? Yeah. If God is enthroned on our praises, who is enthroned on our complaints? Satan. If I if we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, whose gates are we entering and whose courts are we entering when we complain and murmur and grumble? Mm. Words attract presence. It depends on which word you use and which presence is attracted. Words can attract either the presence of God or the presence of the devil. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Prayer and worship. Our position in Christ I mean, simply means our identity in Christ, knowing who we really are, who God has called us to be, right? Okay. All right. Let's move on. Um, we are anointed for battle. Uh, please look at, read the scriptures. I'm just going to go a little fast. Scriptures are like Matthew chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Okay. Uh, we are all anointed for battle, that section says. And um, and page 75 of your PDFs talks about the local church must intentionally advance, advance against the gates of hell. Intentional. Uh, you have to be objective. Make it a point, okay, your life's mission, goes, okay, we're going to advance against the gates of hell. Uh, because we have the weapons, and we've been commanded to do so. Right, John chapter 1, sorry, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 
Can someone read that, please? 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Of the many things that Jesus came to do, he came to destroy the works of the devil. The Son of God manifested himself to destroy the works and the principality of the, of the devil. Are you with me? And someone read Second Colossians chapter. Uh, sorry, Second Colossians. Sorry, Colossians chapter two, verse fifteen. Colossians chapter two, verse fifteen. Yes. So having disarmed, that means he's taken their weapons, their powers, and authorities. He's made up public spectacle of them. That means he put them to shame and triumphing over them by the cross. So we have the victory. We've been given the victory. God's given us the victory. Uh, what are we doing about it? Are we intentionally advancing against the gates of hell? Or are we very comfortable in our own lives, in our churches? Right? Are you all with me? Okay. Um, so let's move on. I'm just going a little bit fast, as I mentioned. Um, page 76, an army has a strategy. An army takes care of its wounded. An army has a strategy. We need to be strategic in what you want to do. right? We ask, we rely on God's uh, wisdom to give us a strategy. Um, time and time again in the Bible, we see that David inquired of the Lord. Right? David inquired of the Lord. He asked, "Can I go now? Will you give them to me?" He goes, "Can you give? Will I? Can I go now? Will you give them? Will you hand them over to me?" God says, "Go." Can I go now? Will you hand them over to me? God says, "Go." And then he asks, "There's one time, again, again." David inquired of the Lord, "Can I go now? Will you hand them over to me?" God says, "Wait. Go down and wait near the balsam trees." When you hear the sound of an army marching, you advance in battle. That means, so God is saying, that means it would mean that I have gone before you and you'll have the victory. How many, being the king of a nation, having seen the victories and tasted victories, David could have easily said, Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to have the same strategy, go and fight against this enemy. What it, like what I did yesterday. No. He leaned into God's heart. He inquired of the Lord. How many of us inquire of the Lord? Do we constantly inquire of Him? Do we lean into Him? Lord, is this your will? Is this your strategy? Is this your strategy? What is your strategy? Speak to me. Right, then that's a sign of humility, isn't it? The constantly waiting on him, trusting in him and not on our own understanding. Yes, uh, not our, on our own understanding talks about wisdom, our intellectual, our knowledge, uh, which can easily happen based on our past experiences or past successes. All good? All okay, any questions? Okay. Right, so uh, just without rushing a little, a little bit, um, spiritual warfare is real. It's it's very real. Um, don't take it easy. Right, and also don't give up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and uh, plus eight and nine. All of us are individuals who might be who will be fighting our own battles. We don't know. I don't need to know what you're going through. Uh, but don't give up. Keep on asking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> He's the God of breakthrough. Amen. <laughs> okay. Uh, so can we continue? Yeah. Rin? Is that okay? You're tired? You want to stretch? You sure? Okay. Are you guys okay? How are you guys doing online? All good? All right. 
<laughs> yeah, thanks, Chira. Okay, let's look at another facet of the church, um, the bride. I love this uh, imagery that the scripture uses. The local church as the bride of Christ. Right? Where time and time again, we see in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, where God uses this imagery, this language of the husband and a wife. The real, like, you know, is constantly comparing. So in the Old Covenant, uh, the way he talks about his people, uh, when I say his people, the people of Israel, the chosen one. Right? Okay, here's the thing. In the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament, there were only two types of people that really mattered. People in the covenant, people not in the covenant. That's all. The people in the covenant were the Jews or the Hebrews or the people of Israel, later known to be that, right? And so he would often relate and talk to them, uh, you know, as, as using the imagery of a husband or a bridegroom. And then later in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we see that he's using the same similar language to the church. Okay, so there are a lot of similarities, but there are certain differences. Uh, so what, again, if you can look at the notes, there are some di differences mentioned. The few differences, but there are a lot of similarities. Um, PDF, page 78, I don't know where you're at. Okay. So under the old covenant, he dealt with them based on the law. However, under the new covenant, he deals with us based on grace. Under the old covenant, not everyone experienced the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives personally. However, under the new covenant, every believer enjoys the personal presence and the work of the Spirit. So these are the few differences. But there are a lot of similarities. So what are the similarities? Under both covenants, God has chosen a people through whom he could bless the nations of the world. Under, under both covenants, God people... God's people are a royal priesthood called to minister unto God. Okay? Um, so in Exodus 19, when you read that chapter, from Exodus chapter 19, verse 1 to 5, I'm just going to paraphrase it. God says, um, you know, you, for you yourself have seen how I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt, uh, you know, on, on my wings, on eagle's wings. And why? I didn't bring you out for the sake of bringing you out. I brought you out to be set apart unto me. To be a nation of priests. God's original plan was for the entire nation of Israel to be priests, not just Levites. Much later, you see uh, Moses asks, Who is on the Lord's side? The Bible says only the Levites came running to Moses. The story of Levitical uh, Levites being priesthood begins there. <laughs> But later in the New Covenant, we see in 1 Peter, Peter writes saying that we are royal priesthood. Right? You're following, right? So the interesting similarities in both the covenants uh, is that God's picture is his relationship with his people as the groom of his uh, to his bride. Okay, we'll read some more scriptures about it. Um, now again, guys, please remember this is another just another imagery that we are using. Right, like how we've been looking at, uh, you know, all these different imageries. So, guys, if you have a problem, deal with it. Move on in life. <laughs> okay. Uh, but this is just an absolute wonderful, wonderful imagery that God would choose. And you, you can think about how the the way that God sees a relationship between a husband and the wife. That He looks at it very holy and pure, for Him to even take that into compare, draw a parallel between his relationship and us. Are you with me? Right? Okay, so um, let's continue. Let's move on just a little bit. Um, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse uh, 2 and 3. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. It says, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown, Israel was holiness to the Lord and first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. I love the NLT version. Uh, it says, I remember 
how eager you were to please me as a young bride. The NLT, uh, New Living Translation. Just, I love that language, the imagery that it paints. Uh, I remember how eager. Eager is what? You're eagerly waiting for something. You're eagerly waiting for someone to come, or you're eagerly waiting for a sale. You know what I'm saying? Right? It's the God is saying that I remember how you once were. You were like a young bride eagerly waiting on me in the wilderness, in a land that is not sown. A we can do a beautiful study on the word called wilderness. It's just beautiful. And when I have the time offline, I'll, I'll share a little bit. But a wilderness was a land of uncertainty. Anything could happen, anytime. Full of dangers, wild animals, scorpions, reptiles. There's no shade in the wilderness. There's no water in the wilderness. But in a place like that, God says, I remember in a place like that, how you were eagerly waiting on me as a young bride. Beautiful, isn't it? Um, see, in the Jewish culture, uh, Again, I apologize for talking a lot about history. Um, so again, in the ancient history, there were only two kinds of civilization uh, in, in general. One was the Eastern civilization, and the other was the Western civilization. Under the Eastern civilization, there were a lot of empires, and, and under the West, Western civilization, there were lots. Um, so the huge differences was in the way they thought. OK, it's very important for us to understand the scriptures. Eastern civilization comes from, say, from the Middle East, you know, the Gulf, and all of that. We call it the Middle East for a reason, right? So Eastern civilization under that, and India and all some of the Asian countries come under the category of Eastern civilization. And the, when we say the West, when, even today we talk about the West, isn't it? Oh, this is the Western culture, this is the Western culture. Most of the time we refer to United States of America. But the West originally was, so its sources from Europe. Greece and Rome, mostly the Greece, their influence on the European part of the countries was huge. So a Westerner will think that the Lord is my will say that the Lord is my provider. Versus the Easterner would say the Lord is my shepherd. Both means the same thing. So for a Westerner, their logic of thinking was that it will it will make sense here first and then make sense here. And for an Easterner, it would, should make sense here first and then here. Right? A person from Greece would say that, okay, the Lord is my provider. He's absolutely right. It makes sense here. The Lord provides. Right? He provides for every day our needs, finances, food, and puts food on our table. He provides. It makes literal sense, isn't it? Logical sense. But when you think about an Easterner would say, the Lord is my shepherd. It touches here. It does something here. Are you with me? Right? And so, and so in the Jewish custom, if a person, if a if a young woman was betrothed, if a couple was betrothed to one another, if they were engaged, it was as good as they were married. And from the time that they were engaged until they get married, they will not see each other. That was a, such was the custom and the tradition of their. Uh, it's kind of similar, you know. You can see a lot of similarities in India, uh, right? And so, yeah, there's a lot of influence of that. Uh, okay, let's go on. But this is a very intimate relationship that God draws a parallel from. Okay, uh, yeah, let's. Jeremiah three fourteen uh, says, "Return, O backsliding children," says the Lord, "for I am married to you." I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Does anybody know what he's actually referring to here? When God, when we say that God is a jealous God or a zealous God, yeah, exactly. You hit the nail on the head. He will not tolerate you worshipping someone else. And I'm not sure if I've said this before. What adultery is in the natural is what idolatry is in the spiritual. 
right? What adultery is in the natural. Think of all, everything, all the lives that an adultery can ruin. Adultery is a very selfish act, isn't it? Like, you know, and it's immoral in so many ways. But that's compared to idolatry in the spiritual. When you have someone else in place of God, when something else, or something or someone takes the place or the priority of God, uh, God's not happy. He doesn't like to share. He loves you like no other. He will not share you with any other. That's a very good kind of jealousy. A jealousy that burns with fire for you and for me. Are you with me? Right? Um, Jeremiah, let's move on. Jeremiah 31, 3 to 4. says, The Lord has appeared of old to me and saying, by the way, how many of you know Jeremiah was, is also known as a weeping prophet? Yeah, and he's writing, I mean, what a guy to write about, you know, uh, such imagery. Uh, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt. O virgin of Israel, you shall reign and you shall again be adorned with your tambourines and shall go forth in dances of those who rejoice. Jeremiah 31, 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to lead out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. I cared for you, I took care of you, I loved you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, I draw you close to me. But they forsook. So he's assuring his wayward people, saying, my love for you is everlasting. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said that. What's the point in praying, you know, okay, Lord, be with me, be with me, be with me. God will be like, like how can I answer a prayer that I've already answered? <laughs> how can I answer a prayer that I've already answered? Exactly. <laughs> Right, so he's drawing, he speaks of a covenant that he's established with his people in terms of being a husband, isn't it? Uh, when someone is getting married, uh, we use these words. We have now all gathered together for the holy matrimony of so and so. Why do we call it the holy matrimony? We've learned, we've learned enough about the word holy. It simply says, set apart, isn't it? So when a woman and a man and a woman comes together for holy matrimony, as, as a man is saying, I can have all, you see all these women out there in the world, of all these women out there that I can possibly have access to, I'm setting myself apart only for you. The same thing about the woman. Of all these men out there in the world, I'm going to have eyes only for you. Because I'm setting myself apart only for you. What is that? That's why we call it as a holy matrimony. We are setting apart for each other, apart from the world. Are you with me? And when God says, I have set you apart. I have set you apart. He's saying that I, he wants us to have eyes only for him. He's a zealous God, isn't it? And that's why he takes this relationship very seriously. Okay, let's move on just a little bit. Um, you will call me my husband. Uh, the book of Hosea is around the theme of God, the husband wooing back his wayward wife. Have you studied the book of Hosea? It's incredible. Uh, I think earlier this year we did a series on Hosea. Uh, not on Hosea, but it was a series on... I forgot the name of the series. But a huge part of it was on Hosea. Uh, and if you study the book of Hosea, it's, it's like, how can God ask someone to do this? 
you will wonder that right how you know god asks hosea to marry a, a wayward wife a prostitute right uh, i mean we don't have time to discuss that question now okay how can god ask we'll discuss that later uh, but is using again the imagery there israel is like this wayward wife i will keep constantly love her i'm pursuing her but she is choosing to go back to the world she does not have eyes for me are you with me yes um are you guys okay right all right okay i think uh, we've spoken enough uh, if you don't mind why don't you uh, do, would you all, you okay to go back and read the rest of the chapter by yourself um, it's pretty self explanatory but uh, because i just don't want to rush through it and i want us to understand the beauty of it right uh, this this beautiful relationship that god draws a parallel from um <clears throat> so as individuals and as a collective as a church we are called to be set apart we are called to be holy just as a bride is a pure and a holy bride is we are called to be ready as the parable talks about 10 virgins uh right we're called to be ready for his uh, arrival are we ready as a church the spirit and the bride says come revelation chapter 22 verse 17 right as are we connected are we the spirit of god here on earth is all up, is is assigned with establishing the works of god here on earth and so are we in tune with the holy spirit to say the spirit and the bride say come yes um so let's st stop there <laughs> um right um so there's there's something beautiful happening um in and through the church he wants to do something beautiful um and for that we need to understand what we are carrying the relationship that in the way that he looks at us and ministry is born out of the revelation of who he is and the way he looks at us and and there are notes in the in the same chapter it says that god looks at his people as his beloved hepsiba and it says another uh, i forget which verse and it says oh uh, wait let me see oh yeah it's in uh, isaiah 62 was 4 and 7 it's in the notes isaiah chapter 62 was 4 to 7 you can read it it says uh you shall no longer be termed forsaken nor shall your land any more be termed desolate you shall be called hepsiba which means my delight and your land beula means married that's what it is okay for the lord delights in you and your land shall be married and so just like the way god rejoices over his people that you know, we we as a church ought to rejoice over each other Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, all right. So we'll officially stop there. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for joining in, everybody online. I hope there was something we could take away from today's session. Uh, God bless you. I'll see you again next week.